There's a funny joke that I read recently about a new army commander who had just been assigned a new unit. This unit had been stationed at the same barracks for years, and as he was doing his first walkthrough, he saw two soldiers who were standing in the courtyard guarding an old wooden bench. He walked over and asked the soldiers, what are you guarding? And they responded that they had been given orders to guard this bench. And thinking that it was some sort of memorial or something, he asked the soldiers, well, what importance does the bench hold for this unit? But they didn't know. The general went on with his duties, and day by day, he would see that bench with the soldiers guarding it day and night, and it started eating away at him. Why was this bench so important, but no one in the unit knew why they're guarding it? So finally, he decided to call up the previous unit commander and ask him. He calls him up and he says, there's this bench in the courtyard that has two armed soldiers assigned to guard it. Is there some sort of ritual or memorial? And the older commander says, I don't know. When I first came to the unit, there were soldiers guarding it. And so I just kept them in their uh, rotation. You could try calling the commander that was there before me. So the new commander finds his phone number and calls him up and asks. But that commander said the same thing. It was like that before he got there. And so he just kept it going. So in a last ditch effort to solve the mystery of the guarded bench, the commander calls up the guy that was in charge of the unit before the last guy. He finds his phone number, calls him up and says, there's a wooden bench in the courtyard that seems to have some importance to the unit. And I'd like to know what it is so that our unit can fully respect the memory that it serves. And the old commander says, wait, are you talking about the wooden one in the middle of the courtyard? And the new commander relieved says, yes, with the two soldiers standing guard. The older commander says, after all of these years, is that paint still not dry? <laughs> For this month, we're in a series called How To, and we're looking at some of the practices of our faith. Today, we're tackling a little bit more of an abstract topic, how to love like Christ. When I first started looking at this topic, it seemed pretty straightforward. I mean, there's scriptures in the New Testament that tell us what true love looks like. But what I realized is that while most of us can give some sort of example of Christ-like love, when it comes down to it, we don't always demonstrate it with our own lives, which has prompted a lot of statements that many of us recognize and have even probably said at one time or another. So I want to do a quick little exercise. So put both of your hands up with your fingers out. Now I'm going to make a couple statements and I want you to put one finger down for each of these statements or variations of these statements that you have either heard or even said yourself within, let's say, the past five years. Okay, here's the first statement. The church needs more, uh, to love people more. What the world needs now is love. Love and acceptance are two different things. I have to love you, but I don't have to like you. Love is the answer. All we need is love. The church is full of hatred and hypocrisy. Now, I'm pretty sure that most of us have put down almost all of our fingers. So go ahead and comment below how many fingers you put down. We see variations of these statements in the news, on social media, music, everywhere. I mean, you may even be singing right now either, all you need is love, or what the world needs now is love, sweet love. So I don't think that there's a lack of understanding the what or how of loving like Christ. But instead, I think we have a misunderstanding of why love like Christ. When we ask, how do I do something? Oftentimes the answer that we get back is a list of steps to do in a specific order. And if you ask the army commander from the story, how do you make sure that no one sits on this bench? His response is find two soldiers and then give them orders to guard it. But when we ask the question, why? The answer requires us to take a step back out of the procedures so that we can understand the process. And when we understand the process that causes those steps to work, it becomes a natural part of what and how we do things. So the question today shouldn't be, how do I love like Christ? But instead it should be, why do I love? Our first scripture is 1 John 4.19, which says, we love because he first loved us. The word love in the original text means to wish well to, to take pleasure in, or to long for. So this scripture can't be read as, I like other people because Christ loved me. That demeans of, of all of its power. We love, we wish well to others, we take pleasure in them, and we long for them because Christ wishes us well, takes pleasure in, and longs for us. So this gives us our reason and also our first issue. Our love is reliance on Christ's love. 
Now, Christ's love is perfect. It's freely given and unconditional. So that's not the issue. The issue is that our perception of that love can be skewed into fault. And if that happens, then the love that we model becomes faulty. We love because Christ first loved us. But if our view of Christ's love is dependent on me being a good person, good enough to be lovable, then when we make the decision to love others, it will innately be on whether we deem that person to be lovable. I think that's our first step in loving like Christ. We have to believe that we are worthy of his love, not because of anything we've done, but because God said we were. Look at Ephesians 2, 4 through 10. It says, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, you have been saved through faith, And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So what do we see here? We see that God's great love is what brought Christ to earth. So his love for us predates the cross and resurrection. God has always loved you. And it's because he's always loved you that the cross even happened. Most of us may be able to get behind the idea that God's love is something we didn't earn. We couldn't have earned it. But I think the thought that Christ isn't even the reason that God loved us might be a challenge. We tend to have this picture of an angry God the Father who demands justice. Then an empathetic Jesus chooses to come down and pay the penalty for sin. And that's how we are now accepted and loved by God. But the fact is God still wanted the best for us took pleasure in and longed for us even without a sacrifice. And I think understanding this is necessary to having a healthy view of God the Father. And without a healthy view of God the Father, who is love, our perception of love will be wrong. And you can't truly love until you receive God's love in its full, truly unconditional form. Also, you can't earn the love of God. You can only receive it. It's not based off of your good or bad deeds. It predates your good and bad deeds. One of the prayers that Jesus prayed is that we would experience the same unity that he, Holy Spirit, and the Father had. And I believe that our being filled with Holy Spirit is the fulfillment of that prayer. Through Holy Spirit, we are unified with love himself. The same love that sent Christ, sacrificed, and resurrected. Romans 5.5 says, And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who had been given to us. That's the unity that he, that was prayed for. So we definitely have access to this perfect love. And if we have access, then we have the ability to embody it. It's interesting that John makes the statement, we have come to know and to believe the love of God. This implies that these are two different pieces, knowing and believing. The scriptures that we looked at uh, have given us enough to know God's love, but do you believe it? Do you believe that it is unconditional? That regardless of what you've accomplished or not accomplished in your life, the fullness of God's love is being poured out on you. Do you believe that God wants the best for you, takes pleasure in you, and even longs for you? That's the first step. 1 John 4, 20 and 21 is what immediately follows the we love because Christ loved us scripture. It says, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And this commandment that we have from him, uh, whoever loves God must also love his brother. We were good until that scripture, right? I mean, if anyone says they love God but hates their brother, which in the original language means a member of the same religious community, then they're lying about loving God. And that's a strong statement. And this is where our perception of God's love becomes critical. Because if we can't love those around us, then we can't love God correctly. If we view God's love as hands off, uh, then the way that we love others in God is going to be hands off. And if we don't believe that we are worthy of God's love, then we won't truly love others like Christ. I want to ask a question. 
Most of us have a relationship to a small child. Maybe it's your own kid or a grandbaby or your niece or nephew or a younger cousin or even a close friend's kid. Um, Think about your relationship to that tiny human. Is that child lovable? All of us would probably say yes. And of course, there's things that get on our nerves about them. Maybe uh, they cry a lot or they haven't learned personal boundaries yet or they constantly ask questions. And even though we see those faults, we still want the best for them. We enjoy time with them and we want to hang out with them. Now, what about your coworker or boss? Are they lovable? Do you wish them well, enjoy being around them and try to spend time with them? That one might be a little bit more iffy. Now, let's go further. What about the political candidate that ran against who you voted for? Are they lovable? Or what about a homeless person asking for money on the street corner? Is he lovable? What if he's faking it and is just using people's generosity to avoid working a job? Is he lovable? Or how about an illegal immigrant? Are they lovable? Or someone from the Middle East or China or Russia? What about a national terrorist? Are they worthy of love? Not just somebody's love, but specifically your love. Are they worthy of your love? At some point, there was probably a level that you went, oof, because you've drawn a line for what it means to be worthy of love. And it's so hard to step past that line, especially when parents or society were the ones who showed you where and how to draw it. But the fact is, we can't go around claiming to love God while we still harbor hate, even under the guise of safety or freedom. So here's the deal. I don't think we have the ability in ourselves to love beyond the lines that we have drawn. It's not a natural love. That's why we have to rely on the work of Holy Spirit in our lives. It's not a natural love because it's supernatural. Jesus has called his followers to an unnatural kind of love because it is supernatural and takes supernatural power. The New Testament has a lot of scriptures about loving one another, but the one that I want to end with today is what Jesus told us in Luke 6, 27 through 36. It's a long section, so um, just bear with me. It says, But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you. And from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful even as your father is merciful. We need supernatural love in our lives, first to receive and then to embody it. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, I thank you that um, first and foremost, that uh, love is a fruit of your spirit and that when we are abiding with you, And when we have received you, that that is something that you are creating in us, that you are building up this this unconditional love so that we can show it to others because that is the love that we've received. I thank you that you are breaking down the lies that God the Father is angry. Um, Anything that that contradicts the gospel, God, we're asking that you would come and reveal those lies to us and break them down in our hearts so that It wouldn't be a barrier between us and God and us and other people. And so we just say, we're open to you. Do your work. Break down the the walls. Break down the hatreds that we've harbored in our hearts and bring light and love into them. And so we just thank you for the work that you're doing. And we ask all of this in your name. Amen.